A Holocaust survivor from here in the North Country returns to one of the world's most notorious concentration camps at Auschwitz. Vladimir Munk, a retired SUNY Plattsburgh professor, joined more than 100 other survivors on that trip, along with his friend Julie Canepa and two local filmmakers, Paul Frederick and Bruce Carlin, who teamed up to produce an incredible documentary on Vladimir's return to the Nazi death camp. And we are so pleased that you have joined us today to uh, talk about, well, a memorable trip and, and a memorable film that we're proud to be presenting here on Mountain Lake PBS. You traveled with Vladimir back to Auschwitz in January of 2020, a month or so before the outbreak of the pandemic. He attended a memorial marking the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Uh, liberation of Auschwitz. He was one of about 100 Holocaust survivors invited to attend the ceremony. And Julie, you accompanied Vladimir on that trip. You had written some articles about him for a local newspaper, Sun Community News, and then that grew into a friendship and he asked you to go with him on this trip? Yes, it was sort of an evolution. Um, I met Vladimir at uh, Lake Forest where he lives through my friend Tim Hartnett. We played music there. And um, Vlad I was introduced to Vladimir by Tim at the time, and uh, we started going back to his place and having a shot of his slivovitz and his um, usual hospitality. And um, as I gradually got to know him, um, he told me some stories about his Holocaust experience. And I felt like they were stories that many people may never have heard before. So I did write that series of articles for The Sun. And after those that came out, um, I thought there was more to his story and I was really hoping that we could um, record it for posterity in some way. So that's when I uh, reached out to Paul and asked him if he might uh, get some uh, video of Vladimir telling his story so that we could um, see what we had to work with and kind of take it from there. Yeah, I think that was in February of 2019. We decided we would at least get uh, an interview recorded and then look for funding and you know that process because you know a great idea is a great idea but to take on a full documentary we needed some some capital so um, we did the interview you know you're immediately enthralled with Vladimir you can't help but love him and his story was amazing um, so Julie and I talked and we said okay let's look for some funding and then November of that year she said Vladimir just got a letter and he got asked to go back in January for the 75th uh, uh, liber uh, celebration of the liberation of the camp. And I was like, now that's an amazing story <laughs> if we could follow him back. We needed to convince Vladimir and he was fine with uh, letting us come along. Um, I knew Julie was going to be with Vladimir the whole time. And I knew I couldn't probably do all that alone. So that's when I contacted Bruce. We, we've worked on some documentaries together said, Bruce, what do you think? He's a big World War II guy. And, oh. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, Paula told me about it um, shortly after f his February interview with Vladimir. He said, oh, you gotta meet this guy sometime. And, and I was like, well, do you, you know, are we gonna be able to do anything with it? And it's, you know, well, without funding, you can't. And, um, and as things have gone, really, uh, we all, uh, Paul and I, you know, just went there on credit cards and, and a hope that when we came back, we could, at least crowdsource to get our money back from uh, from the trip, and and we did, and the community has just been awesome about supporting uh, supporting us and, and helping us uh, in the different steps because there are a lot of expenses people may not think about. They see footage and you think, oh, that's public domain, not really. It's licensed by somebody most likely, and you have to pay. So there are there are quite a few expenses um, in it, and but the community, as I said, really stepped up and and helped us out. And when Paul first pitched the idea and you thought about it, did you say this is a great story? Let's go. Oh, yeah, I didn't. Uh, I mean, uh, as Julie said, or Paul said, um, I, I, in, I'm into World War II from the standpoint. My mom was is British. She lived throughout the bombing of England during World War II. Her village was constantly bombed. And they were on the coast, and the, the bombers on their way back to uh, Europe would drop off whatever they hadn't dropped on London. And so I just grew up knowing about World War II, about the Holocaust, about it. And I've, always, I've read a lot about it. And it, this was like, wow, this is just an amazing opportunity. So, And Julie, Vladimir was 95 at the time. 
and going to undertake this uh, an incredibly emotional trip, returning to the concentration camp where he lost his family. Both of his parents died there. Such a horrible, horrible place. But it seems he was determined to go back. He wanted to go back and see it one last time. Yes, he actually had the opportunity to go back for um, the 70th anniversary of the liberation of the camp. But in that, that year, in 2015, um, his wife Kitty passed, so that wasn't something that he could actually do. So this, just the stars aligned and uh, the timing was just perfect for him to go back and make this journey to honor his relatives, um, over 30 of which had perished there and also probably about the same amount of Kitty's family had, um, had died during the Holocaust as well. So uh, I think the timing was right. His health was still just about at the point where um, he got approval from his doctor and, um, and then we said, okay, we're, we're gonna do this. We're talking with the filmmakers and the writer and co-producer of this amazing film about Vladimir Munch's return to Auschwitz to the death camp that he survived. His friend Julie Canepa and the two documentary filmmakers Paul Frederick and Bruce Carlin are all joining us. You knew, ex well, you knew how incredibly powerful this story could be. Um, well, <laughs> Vladimir, when, he, when we were getting to know each other, Vladimir told me some stories that I think um, I had never heard before. I think many people um, are exposed to Holocaust stories in movies and in books. And I think to start with, the, the Czech experience was a different angle on, on presenting this story, but also Vladimir's memory is amazing. And so that, I think, was the defining factor because the stories that he was able to recall were, they were clear and sharp as if they had, he told them as if they had happened yesterday. And some of them um, were definitely uh, things that I think people might never have known um, Holocaust survivors had experienced. So it was definitely a really powerful and important story to tell. And you mentioned about the 70th gathering. Uh, how difficult of a decision was it for Vladimir to decide to go back after everything that had happened there? Uh, I think, you know, uh, that's why he's a survivor. Um, I remember him sitting at his kitchen table and saying, it will not be pleasant, but we're going to do this. And then he said, um, we're going to need a lot of vodka. Um, <laughs> so he's obviously this incredibly strong person. Uh, not only to survive the Holocaust, but um, to, sur to survive uh, relocating his family in the late 1960s to a, compl a country that, um, you know, coming to the United States. Um, so he's, he's just a very resilient person and uh, very, has a ver an inner strength and, um, and also just really lives in the moment. So I think that's, that those were all factors that played into him making this decision to go. Did he have some reservations though? Um, I, th <laughs> I wouldn't really call them reservations, I have to be honest. I, what he usually did was just joke about that he would die on the way, and, but that was his way. Uh, he would say, um, you know, I have to get my toenails clipped because, you know, just in case they have to put a toe tag on me or, um, you know, like, so he, he kept trying to brace me for the, for the event of his passing on the trip, which I knew was not going to happen. Um, um, but he used his gallows humor to do that, so. And Paul, you and Bruce both knew this would be a great story, a powerful film. How challenging, though, was it to shoot this documentary? Um, it was pretty challenging, for sure. We were traveling around Europe um, just with a backpack of camera equipment. We couldn't uh, bring too much stuff, so literally a backpack, no tripod. We shot it all handheld. Um, Bruce did a lot of, so, so when we found out in November this was gonna happen, we had about a month and a half to really sort of produce and organize and get this going. So Bruce contacted the museums we needed to talk to, got the press passes we needed, you know, booked hotel rooms. And um, when we got there, it was buses and trains. And you know, that's how we got from city to city. Cause when Julie and, uh, and Vladimir came back, we kept going to where uh, Vladimir's hometown, we went to, um, Terra's in the concentration camp he was in, the holding ghetto that, that he was in before he went to Auschwitz. We went there, 
we went to uh, Prague in the Czech Republic. So we covered a lot of those places that you know he spent his early part of his life there. And um, so yeah, very difficult. Language barrier was difficult. Dealing with foreign money was difficult. <laughs> so we just had we had a hand our hands full for sure. And also, just what angle would we take that m would make this different than other t uh, other stories uh, about? survivors returning and we felt that number one having Julie's voice be there um, and kind of that uh, bouncing off of Julie's youth and Vladimir's age and their friendship and how um, you know how through her eyes as well as Vladimir's and Vladimir's as people will see when they watch it his accent is fairly thick still um, and so that was a big challenge uh, taking interviews and and really being able to edit them so that you, it's going to be covered up with b-roll so you're not going to see the, all the little clips of Vladimir forming sentences and, and and paragraphs but that's what it takes to you know to take all hours and hours of interviews and bring it all down to a very short amount of time so there were there were challenges with that for sure a lot of the other big challenges are for a documentary you have to have the visuals so you know, a lot of this parts of his life that, w you know, we weren't sure how are we going to f find a visual for this? What's going to be when he's talking about, you know, when he when he was in, um, uh, what was the whole thing after after his death march? Um, Black Hammer or? Yeah, Black after he went to Black Hammer and they kind of abandoned him, thought he was dead, you know, and, and then they kind of became a traveled around and was yeah, begging begged, for yeah, food begged, and went door to door. You know, like, oh, what are we going to show for that? You know, so a lot of it is just how do you sh visually show these things? Um, and I think a lot a of people challenge. may be surprised by the number of photographs, thinking that perhaps they had been lost, but you, you were able to find them through relatives? Yes, that's one of the things, probably the most asked question is if, if he was in a concentration camp, all his family, you know, perished, how did those photos survive? But they were able to give them to neighbors and right, uh, non-Jewish neighbors non -Jewish and friends, neighbors to hold, yeah, in the hopes that they would get out. And right, and they gave away back. everything they had, uh, and uh, we, I think Vladimir said he, they they got ninety percent of it back, and it, uh, amongst that was uh, the photograph albums, and then he's gathered other other pictures over the years as they've come out from survivors. But I mean, he had thirty plus relatives that died including his parents, so, I mean, they're gone. And I don't think I've ever asked you this in all the interviews we've done. Is there a photograph for him that, that is the most powerful, the most mm -hmm. memorable, the most emotional that he's ever talked about? I'm trying to think of there is. I mean, probably that family photo. Yeah, the, there's family photos. I mean, I think some of the ones with just Vladimir as a youth with his mother. They're so endearing. I think yeah. that's true. I think the ones with his mother, um, all the experiences that he shared with her when he was young, because he did spend most of his time with her while his father was working. His mother taught him how to ski and how to ice skate, and they spent um, time in the mountains in Czechoslovakia together, and there are a lot of pictures of that. But I think what is also really telling is the absence of photos, because in after the German occupation of Czechoslovakia, they, um, they confiscated all cameras. So there was a point where they weren't in Terezin concentration camp. They were still living in their home in the town of Pardubica, but they were unable to take photos because it was, it was forbidden. So they not only had their, um, their radios were confiscated, their cameras were confiscated, and even their, um, all of the pets, their domestic animals, cats, dogs, horses, were confiscated by the Nazis. Um, the pets were auctioned off. And that is actually one great story where uh, they had a dog in their family. His name was Chiggy. Actually, um, Vladimir was not particularly fond of the dog because I think as an only child, it sort of uh, was a almost replacement for him or competition. But um, when the Nazis, um, they, they rounded up all of the domestic pets and they had an auction and any animals that were not, um, purchased at the auction were going to be destroyed. So he had an aunt who was um, not Jewish who was able to purchase their family dog at auction 
and she kept it for years um, in the town. And after the war, he was reunited with the dog. It was one of the few family members that had survived the war. Julie, you narrate the story, telling us how you joined Vladimir on the trip, reliving what it was like there in the concentration camp with him, how he was able to survive, what life was like after he was freed. And in the film, you talk with him about his experiences, his memories, his emotions being back there. How was that for you to be able to tell his story and, and share his story? Um, I think part of the reason why we s sort of ended up structuring the film the way that we did is because Vladimir, as many people know, keeps his emotions very close to the vest. Um, so he's not, um, he, while he's a very um, welcoming and friendly and caring person, uh, his own emotions about that time he does, um, you know, keep very private. So uh, I think I was almost sort of, it, uh, I don't even know what I'm, cut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not sure that's where I'm going. That's the great thing with four cameras, we can cut. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where, where well, I was no, going I, with that. I, I think, um, we'll yeah, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Julie became the, the uh, emotion of the, sh of the story, I think. Um, and I think that it's important because None of us are Jewish. Uh, none of us were, are of the age where we heard these. Bruce heard some of the stories from his family in England, but I, I didn't only knew what they taught us in school about the Holocaust, which wasn't a, a whole lot. So uh, Julie was sort of that conduit, I think, um, to the younger generations out there that might be learning about this. Uh, she, she was like able to ask questions in the show, like, what was he thinking on the way there? And kind of, you know, Vladimir wouldn't give us what he was thinking on the way there, but she was able to kind of interpret that for, for the viewer. He's a man of few words. He's stoic, he's guarded, Very much so, yeah. he uses humor, but so in this case, you being with him were able to interpret what he was feeling. We did see some emotion when he visited the barracks. I think that was where he showed a little more emotion yeah. than- And actually, than I think, I think you mentioned on the first time on the bus trip there, he kind of broke down a little, right? Yes, um, I, I think um, we were riding in the bus and we were on the way to Auschwitz and we were passing by a stand of birch trees. And that is what Auschwitz-Birkenau is actually named after. And he d definitely had a moment where he was looking and I think it wasn't necessarily that the scenery at that exact moment was coming back to him, but I think some flood of emotions and with that incredible memory that he has, um, I think that um, something was just definitely um, being sort of brought up in him, but, but he wouldn't really go so far as to, as to say much more about that because he just does keep things very- Definitely in the barracks private. though is when it seemed to really uh, all, all, I mean, that was towards the end of the day. We'd been four or five hours of traveling around, seeing a lot of the camp, and uh, I think it, at that point, we were all covered in mud on our shoes and tired, and and I think it really hit home when he got in there, and um, that was probably, you know, the most p emotional point for him. And for you, as, as a filmmaker, well, or are you, you know, so focused funny. on yeah. capturing what you need that Bruce and I, we and Julie, we all talked about how we had such a game plan, and and a, you know we needed to tell this story. We only had like literally four to five hours with Vladimir in there on free time, where he wasn't doing some other uh, thing for the 75th. But um, we were very concentrating, very much concentrating on like the shots we needed. I, you know, I, as the cameraman, I'm thinking of the cutaways. What are we going to need to shorten the segment and get this angle? And then we needed to get from uh, Berk from Auschwitz one to Auschwitz two, Birkenau, which is about um, almost a mile away. We had to like, you know, there was five or six, seven of us because there was another film crew following. So we all piled in that guy's van. I mean, we had a wheelchair. It just the logistics of getting everything was quite challenging. And then you know, you, it wasn't till the end of the day I think that it really hit me anyway, uh, what we had experienced. I mean, I mean, you think about it for months and months afterwards. And when you watch it later, you, yeah. and when you, you feel watch the it impact. Later, like when I was doing the editing, I, I couldn't edit 
too, too long because it would just be too powerful. And, and when you add the music and uh, there's something about when the music and the images and the story and the voiceover, when it's all working, uh, it's just like it, it wipes you out because you're, you're, you're editing that and it's just taking a toll on you and you're reliving what it was like being there and you're reliving what Vladimir experienced and what his life must have been like having this happen to him. And so, yeah, it was uh, it took about six to eight months to edit. And it was, you know, was that in the evening and weekends because I still had my regular clients to deal with. And, uh, yeah. you know, we, we'd all work on chunks. And then, you know, uh, I don't think I could have just sat down and just did this project because it was just too emotionally draining, really, to do that much of it at once. And Vladimir is now 98. And we know, we see in the documentary, when he returned home uh, during COVID, he had some health issues. Is, is he doing okay? Yes, he is doing very well for somebody who's 98. And I just saw him the other day, and he said he thinks he has to stick around until he's 100. <laughs> so. Julie Canepa, the co-writer and co-producer, no, not co-writer. Julie Canepa, the writer and co-producer. Paul Frederick, filmmaker. Bruce Carlin, filmmaker. We're talking about this incredible film, Return to Auschwitz, the survival story of Vladimir Munch. The last shot we see in the trailer for this film that was out early has Vladimir standing there in front of the wire fences at Auschwitz with rail cars in the background. It just absolutely gives you a chill. Yeah, that was super powerful, and and we got him to that point. He was walking, um, and and sort of realized that was the spot to to do that kind of sweeping reveal shot and see his face. You want to see what he's looking at, and then you know come around and see his face. And we just said, Vladimir, can you stand here and just look out? And uh, you know, and I and I did it several times just to make sure in different shots and. Afterwards, I just said, are you okay? And he said, yeah, he goes, uh, I, I feel like I'm seeing people. So he just felt like he was like right in the moment. Even though we were doing this little bit of filming, like um, he just felt, you know, like he's, he was having a moment and it really shows in that one shot. It wasn't super staged, but he, he told me afterwards, he goes, I just felt like I was seeing it back when it was full of people, so. And on our website and our YouTube channel, we will share the interview we did with Vladimir and Julie the summer after the memorial when you returned from Auschwitz. He talked about his journey and the emotions of attending the memorial and visiting the grounds and the barracks. And that's on our website and our YouTube channel. The film premiered that September after you returned. During the pandemic, uh, you had screenings at the historic Strand Theater in Plattsburgh. Great crowds and, and a wonderful response to the film. Yeah, it was amazing. I, yeah, they were, um, I believe the first was sold out or mostly sold out and the second one was really full and people just reacted to Vladimir so much when, you know, he had a five minute. Five minute standing ovation at the yeah. end. He stood up and turned around and uh, everything we did was worth it at that moment. And after the screening, you had a nice talk with the audience. Uh, we've put that on our website and YouTube channel as well. That was quite emotional and powerful. But yeah. as you mentioned, that standing ovation for him at the Strand Theater was memorable. We, we, we did that twice. And after the second showing, we were all going up on the stage to do the interview. And he said, uh, I don't think I can watch it again. I'm starting to feel sorry for myself. <laughs> and I don't think he's watched it since. He's watched it the tw two times. Uh, we showed him once before, uh, you know, to see if everything was okay before we showed it. So he saw it the three times and uh, I think he just... It was interesting, the first time he saw it was with some of his family members and we wa went to Paul's house. Paul has a theater downstairs and, and we watched it there. And I don't think he really understood what was gonna be, he was gonna see. I think he thought everything was just gonna be about the time at Auschwitz. So to see the story begin with, you know, and go through his life and all of his pictures and his parents seeing it on a big screen. That was, yeah, I think that it was, was hard. very powerful. And during that discussion at the Strand, uh, you all and Vladimir talked about the importance of making and sharing this film, keeping this story alive so that future generations hear about this, hear about what happened to Vladimir and his family 
and millions of other families so that the world never forgets. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, that was our main goal, I think, for all of us, uh, right from the get-go. Um, as it turned out, we never found any funding for this program, so it's literally a labor of love, and uh, we've since um, found some success with film festivals and nominated for uh, an Emmy um, for humanitarian uh, category, so it's getting success in that that regards but to us it was more important that the world gets a chance to see this story and learn about Vladimir and, and in addition through the PBS uh, and APT it was distributed to I believe 97 percent of yep. the stations uh, wonder about the three percent that didn't take it but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 97 percent of the country got to see it and in Canada many many Canadians were able to watch it as uh, we are here with it where you share um, a border, we share a border with Quebec that happens all the way across the country. So many Canadians have had an opportunity as well. And how's that feel to have it uh, be seen nationwide and in Canada by, uh, by a PBS audience? Feels amazing for sure. I mean, I don't know how, we've never talked about it, Julie, but from your initial idea, I mean, it must feel pretty, pretty crazy that we made this happen. <laughs> I mean, I, it amazes me that we, we, we made this program because we, we had adversity in every sort of step of the way. There's a story, it's very long to tell, but Bruce and I barely got in Auschwitz the day to film because of a mix up in paperwork. Um, there was some very tense 45 minutes where we didn't think we were gonna even be able to film. So- uh, and Hall was nose to nose with a guard who was not, not letting, letting him in, in and, with the camera. And we had, we had paid money for a guide um, we and we were not going to go away. So yeah, if, if we, we just they kept let us it. in, yeah. we had no documentary. So and that Vladimir, was our yeah, and Vladimir and Julie had been arrived at a different time. They were already in the camp. They're looking around. Where are we? We're trying to get in. So when yeah. we talk about the challenges of making this There's film at that very sure. moment, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was quite a hurdle. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I literally had a guard. I didn't. He didn't speak English. I didn't, didn't speak Polish. And you know, he just kept pointing to my backpack with the camera gear and he's going like this and I'm like, we're supposed to be here. And uh, so it was it was stressful to say the least. But we've also, you know, coming up with the, the footage we needed and how are we gonna pay for this? And yeah. we, we did get some money from uh, crowdsourcing, um, but you know, a lot of it was just really being, trying to figure it out, you know, put together a puzzle basically is what we had to do. So PBS did provide you with an avenue to, to a national audience. Yes, for sure it did. You know, we, uh, we approached uh, you folks here at Mountain Lake PBS before we shot anything. We came and said, do you think this would be something you'd be interested in? And, and I remember you and Paul King and several others said, this, not only would we be interested, we do think this is a good national program. So, um, so that, was, uh, that was the start in PBS. And you know, it's gonna be a two year window that they can broadcast it now. And, Anyone with Passport can watch it across the country. So yeah, super excited that it's, it's, it's out there. That was our main goal. And congratulations on the Emmy nomination. Uh, we expect you know, within a few days here in June, uh, you're going to hear uh, about that and, and uh, keeping our fingers crossed for you, that would be a nice honor. Yeah, it sure would be. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't do these things for awards, but when you get you know, nominated, it's, uh, it's a great honor. So and then to win, that would be just uh, awesome. Yeah, it's kind of the, we've always called this the little show that could, because I mean, literally it's three of us coming together with very limited resources and putting out something that is now seen across the country, seen across the world. I mean, Julie went back to Prague and showed it there. Um, so it's like, it's, it feels really good. It feels really good to have done something of this magnitude with, with uh, so little. <laughs> and Julie, you did return. You returned to Poland and you returned to Vladimir's hometown yes. uh, to write a book about his, his life story. Yes, well, initially I thought the trip back to Prague was going to be to help me with the book and to help me do some research and sort of walk the streets that Vladimir had walked with his parents and go to some of the places that he had gone with them. And then once I was there, um, there was a, a movement and some uh, very hardworking people that were putting together a memorial for the, um, the Jewish population of his hometown of Pardubice who had been um, deported to Terezin. 
and they had um, they had created a plaque, and it, there was a service where they um, um, they memorialized it on the building where they had held all of these people, including Vladimir and his parents, and it was just. And then after this event, we actually showed the film to people who were from the town, and it was just incredibly impactful. Uh, the audience responded, even though many people, there was a translator there, so everyone's comments were being translated from Czech into English for me. But it was uh, just an incredible experience to show it to people from his hometown. And I did get a private tour of a medieval castle where Vladimir and his parents used to ride their bikes and then climb up this castle. And, and Vladimir told me he would run around the ramparts and I got to see this place, and it was really magical, and it was, it was a really incredible trip. Did you find anything there to help with the telling of his story that you didn't know or have before? I have to tell you that his, as I said before, his memory is so amazing. His recall for his childhood experiences is just um, unbelievable. So there wasn't really a moment. I, it was great to be in places where I knew that he had been with his family, but he had painted the picture so clearly for me that I really didn't go back and change some things that I had written after having been there because it, he had really um, just had those images so, so um, clearly in his mind. And had he met his wife, Kitty, there? Were they childhood sweethearts? So he, he actually met her in Terezin, in he the did, concentration okay. camp. Okay. Yeah, she was from another town in Czechoslovakia. Okay, so she wasn't part of his story no. growing up there. And the book is soon out. Yes, finally. <laughs> Long awaited, <laughs> by myself included. <laughs> and where, where can folks find it? So, well, it'll be available on Amazon. And um, should I say, it'll sure. be available during the pledge drive in June, uh, so it comes out June 6th, and, um, and it'll be available. Maybe even a signed copy by Vladimir, we're, we're hoping, fingers crossed. And how is that, writing that book for you? Uh, I had, this was a di very different kind of writing for me. I've been writing for a dozen years for regional publications about um, arts and culture events, uh, about local restaurants and architecture, um, historical homes, um, doing the Strictly Business Forum. I had never written, this is actually a, a historical fiction. It's a novel based on Vladimir and his wife Kitty's life, and I had never done that before, and that was proved to be uh, very much of a challenge. Um, especially um, trying to work through the pandemic and um, trying to get all the information I needed and trying to make sure that not only was I telling his story accurately, but also that I was placing everything in the right historical context. So it required a lot of research and I don't think I really anticipated that at first. So, And just to go back a little bit about remembering all of this, uh, do you worry that that may not be happening today, that, that today's millennials and Generation Z either don't know, don't understand the significance of, of what happened or, or concerns that ultimately this could potentially happen again? You know, I mean, it's a fact that uh, I believe it was 2020, the Pew Institute did research, a research institute uh, found that 25% uh, of high school students had never heard of the Holocaust, never heard of it, let alone have really an understanding of what, of what happened. And many people don't, they're not interested. And they don't believe that it could happen again. And so I think one of the things is, we've been talking about decisions that you make when you start on a project like this. One of the decisions we talked about was how graphic to be with the concentration camp footage and, and the historical footage. And we chose not to be as graphic as we could have for the reason that we wanted students to be able to watch this in eighth grade, 10th grade, and be able to, you know, concentrate on the story and not be so sent into shock by the, the reality of what, of what is available to see. So that was a decision. And I think that we've gotten a lot of good positive comments about that, about dialing it back a little bit. So I think it was a good decision.
and a sense of importance in telling the story and sharing the story. Yes, and uh, Mountain Lake uh, has done some amazing uh, teacher's resource guide that's online. Uh, Julie's more involved with that. Right. Do you want to On talk? PBS Learning Media, so um, assets from the film, some of the clips were used to create resources for teachers to use in their classrooms, um, grades 6 through 12, and those are on, available on PBS Learning Media for free. Um, so we're really thrilled to have been able to do that. Um, part of that was um, through a grant with the Chapel Hill Foundation, which um, was amazing. They, we had some teachers from SUNY who created resources, and then we worked with those and launched them on PBS Learning Media. And we know that um, not just our regional educators, but also anyone across the United States, any teachers across the United States can access those resources and hear Vladimir's story and share it with their students. So which was really important to him because after he retired, he spent a lot of time going to schools in the region, telling his story. Um, initially, it was with Kitty when she was alive, and then after she passed, he went by himself, and he would uh, bring artifacts with him, like a star and some other um, things that he had made in the camp where he was. and. Telling the story to, stu to students of that age, I think especially middle school, is so impactful. After we showed the film, we had so many parents um, come to us and just tell us that it, it sparked conversation with their kids. Um, even if they never had conversations with their kids, it, it sparked a conversation, and, and that's really was w one of our goals, and we were so glad to hear that the film had that end result. We showed it at the Strand to uh, to just some students, and my friend had a daughter in the crowd, and she told him, some kids in front of him said, my dad said this never happened. So, I mean, that's a lot of people think that, and we gotta just make sure it's not forgotten about, and that people realize it did happen. And here's a person who lived it, and Vladimir came in, standing ovation again, and I think the kids were, were floored to see him walk in at that moment, but, um, you know, we, we just got to make sure people realize won't be that many more years. There won't be any survivors left to tell the firsthand story. So shows like this are going to be important. And for all three of you, a, a sense of pride in being able to tell the story and share the story with a national audience. Yeah, most definitely. Um, everyone loves to share an experience that was incredible to them. So to be able to share this is, you know, because you can't really feel what we felt, but I think you, you get close. The moment, um, I don't know if we should spoil it, but it depends <laughs> when the segment airs. The moment where Julie and Vladimir are walking and we're, we're kind of leaving and, sh and Julie just really breaks down and both Bruce and I were, were crying. I mean, it was a moment that is, uh, I'll never forget. And I think anyone watching the show at that point feels a lump in their throat as well. Paul Frederick, Bruce Carlin, Julie Canepa, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.